Welcome to On The Point Podcast, a podcast for all things Overwatch with a heavy focus on League, discussing roster moves, weekly matchups, and two weeks worth of matches because sometimes technical difficulties just rear their ugly heads and life happens, you guys. Yeah, yeah, that's just kind of the way that shit goes sometimes. So yeah, so we are doing another one of our famous double episodes where we have two weeks worth of matches to talk about, so we're not going to go into depth on a lot of them. It's going to be a few more broad strokes, more fun stuff like that. I am Katie. I am the support main. I am a CJ. I am the tank main with the broken foot. Oh, honey. <laughs> that, that's, not a, that's not a joke, by the way. I, I actually broke my foot between, uh, you know, when we last recorded it. And that was not the technical difficulty that we were talking no. about. <laughs> no, that, that was an entirely separate incident. It's been a good two weeks, you guys. It's just been fun. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Let's just get the ball rolling, man. Let's just do this. We, we have the results of our week 13 matches, which mm. was two weeks ago, which is when we finally got back on the ball to talk about things. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, we didn't like get to record our predictions for week 14. So that will not be affected in our current uh, batting average calculations. First one, because uh, yeah, we're, we're doing the batting averages again. We're kind of restarting from zero. Uh, yeah, because 10 weeks of not doing things is just like, we're not looking up the old shit. Who cares? Let's just go. That was the before times. Yeah, yeah, before the plague. Uh, anyway, so uh, first up, Guangzhou Charge versus Seoul Dynasty. We both picked Guangzhou, and that came out uh, in the favor of Guangzhou with a 3-0 win. Up next, the NYXL took on the Shanghai Dragons. We both went uh, Shanghai on that, although I will say, you thought... I, I remember you going into that being kind of on the fence before coming down on the side of Shanghai. Yeah, because they're both really strong teams, and we, we went to a map five for this, so... Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, so, next up, Dallas Fuel versus Washington Justice. We both picked Dallas, because why wouldn't you? Uh, LA Val uh, Dallas gets the 3-0 win. LA Valiant versus uh, Atlanta Rain. We both went with Valiant, and Valiant pulled out the win at 3-2. Up next, pulled out but... a reverse sweep, and I did some screaming and scared the neighbors and the cat, because that's how I live. Uh, yeah, I, I will say, like, I having talked you into that and then just put us at a tie at this point, like, annoyed me so much, because I was just like, I would have been in the lead. You're almost honestly... always in the lead? Yeah. Let me have this. <laughs> it's my birthday on Sunday. Let me have this. No. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> not your birthday yet but fair enough it will uh, be by the time this comes out true uh <laughs> next is houston outlaws versus san francisco shock we both picked shock and shock delivered with the zero to with the zero to three sweep in their favor um soul dynasty versus hangzhou spark hangzhou gets the win three zero i picked soul you picked hangzhou so yes um NYXL versus Chengdu Hunters. We both picked the uh, New York team, and they take the uh, win 3-1. to one. And there was a draw in that match, wasn't there? Yes, it was pretty. Yeah. It was a little more tightly contested than that 3-1 um, would make you think initially. Yeah. Excuse me, that was a burp. Um, up next, Philadelphia Fusion versus Paris Eternal. I went with Fusion, you went with Paris, and Philadelphia carried the day 3-2. Next, Florida Mayhem versus Boston Uprising. We both picked Florida, and Boston um, did not fail to live up to our current expectations of their performance. Boston the was consistent. Today. Consistent is a word. An yes. accurate word. But... Uh, Toronto Defiant versus LA Gladiators, and the Gladiators uh, pick up the win 3-1, as we predicted, though Toronto started off strong. Well, and I'm trying to remember, was there a tied map in this one too, or was it just straight? I don't think so. I'm not there was, sure. I remember thinking about this week and thinking about what I would say in the episode that we would have recorded, and I mm -hmm. remember one of my comments being, we live in a world this week where the Houston Outlaws, Toronto, and Boston all played better than Seoul. 
Mm-hmm. Because this was this was a rough, rough week for Saul. This was really bad. Like um, they got yeah. bodied. Yes, they did. It was it was not good. To the point where Guangzhou broke the record for shortest match time. Yeah, Body they, um, soul. they went straight through them. Um, yeah, it was it was a really bad week to be a fan of Soul Dynasty. It was a bad week to be Soul Dynasty. I I don't yeah. know what happened aside from the match the, the hero pool just being really bad for them. Um, it comes out to a few things, which is the hero pool is bad for them. Um, and honestly, I talked about I I had some notes about this just going into the the next week of matches just because it becomes a little more relevant there um but uh the uh the batting average for both of us is 0. 0.889 which is so. the best i have ever done Woo! yay looking forward to ruining it this week <laughs> yeah, we'll see, uh, <laughs> yeah we'll see how it looks after week 15 uh week we, 14 number, well, I, just, I, I want to chat about week 13 a little bit because it's gonna you know we're gonna get a little more into depth than 14 because it's what just happened but there were a lot of matches in week 13 that, again, the numbers lie about how hotly contested they were because you don't see draws in the numbers. Mm-hmm. So that just, I, I find this interesting. I find Toronto taking a map off of the Gladiators for the first time ever to be something worth writing home about, at least. Yeah, Especially no. after they dropped Kellex and picked up, help me. Cruz. Thank you. How did I forget that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. Anyway, it's been, it's been a day. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I I've, I've been on record as saying that I think um, they're they have some deficiencies at a lot of roster spots, and I always thought Calix was competent if unspectacular, and what Toronto needed was you know was one just coaching to really sort of take the team's hand and push them forward. Maybe another DPS player, maybe, uh, you know, some shoring up on tank. Um, and then we have, uh, I, I, you know, thought the support line could use some help as well because Kareev is great. I just never really had a spectacular amount of confidence in Kellex to really um, sort of help carry the day. So picking up Cruz, I like because I think Cruz is mechanically better of the two, and we know that he is an in-game leader. He's someone who will talk and communicate and help guide the team, which is, I, I, I think, looking at the games they had, even though they didn't win them, uh, they looked a lot better. Yeah. And again, you, you take the relative strength of the Gladiators, who are in a difficult division and pretty high up in it, and yeah. Toronto putting up a fight as opposed to getting rolled, which we've seen them do fairly consistently this season. Yes. Like, this this is where my skill in being an Outlaws fan and before that being a Denver Broncos fan and Air Force Falcons fan comes into play. You don't sit there and look at the win-loss. You sit there and go, well, damn, that was better. <laughs> Yep. You take what you can get sometimes. Pretty much, pretty much. Signs of life are uh, important in these sort of situations. And Valiant taking the reverse sweep win for the first time this season. I'm not sure if the first time all franchise, but the first time this season. Yeah, I, I don't know either. It's They had it up as a fact. I just remember the fact that they put up as uh, making Halsey proud, which... <laughs> I lost my shit. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Captain Planet. You give me life. Yeah, he's always those, great. Yeah, for those who don't know, Captain Planet is the stats guy for Overwatch League. Yeah, he, he always has great little um, bits to kind of introduce stuff. He's always got like a pithy little headline, which is nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a good time. So, yeah. Week 13 was a good time to be an Overwatch League fan in general, and just a bad time to be a Soul fan. And then we move on to week 14, and how the turns have tabled. Yeah, um, so we have the rematch between the Shanghai Dragons and the Soul Dynasty, which was previously a 3-0 drubbing in the favor of the Shanghai Dragons. And then Soul Dynasty picks up the win uh, 3-2 in a very, very tightly contested series. Next, we have the Chengdu Hunters versus the London Spitfire, with London picking up the win 3-0. 
Next, Guangzhou Charge takes on New York uh, Excelsior and takes them down 3-1. Paris Eternal versus LA Gladiators, and Paris gets the 3-1 victory. Washington Justice goes up against Vancouver Titans in the swan song of Stratus and gets the uh, 3-1 win to send them off. Next, Houston Outlaws versus Atlanta Reign, and Atlanta dominated 3-0. LA Valiant versus Boston Uprising ends, I think, as we kind of would predict, uh, with a 3-0 in the favor of LA Valiant. Because Uh, Boston. (laughs) Yes. Hangzhou Spark took on the Shanghai Dragons and fell as the latest uh, victim of the Dragons' violence, uh, 0-3. London Spitfire takes on Guangzhou Charge, and Guangzhou runs them over 3-1. Dallas Fuel takes on Philadelphia Fusion in a very closely contested uh, 3-1 loss. Uh, Toronto Defiant takes on the San Francisco Shock, and they start off strong, but ultimately the Shock take the 3-1 win, and then the Florida Mayhem take on the uh, well, the second game of the newly reconstituted Vancouver Titans and uh, smashed them 3-0. So I know we want to talk a little bit about what changed for Shanghai. The other ones I want to look at this week are um, London, especially. Mm -hmm. And I want to take a closer look at the Dallas and Philly game. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about the Washington Justice, but um, a bitch is biased. So Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of those talking points sort of scattered throughout. But let's start with Seoul. Yeah. So... Night and day. Yeah, honestly, um, they looked a lot better. And so I think it comes down to a few different factors. Um, one is this week's bands, I think, created a meta that leans more into the strengths of the Dynasty than the bands on, on the earlier match did. Uh, Jester has improved a lot as Reinhardt, but it's still one of his weaker main tanks. Um, additionally, Marvel's performances on Diva haven't really been stellar, and fits on McCree can be very, very feast or famine. Uh, we know that Jester has a great Arisa. We saw Marvel look a lot more comfortable on Sigma than he does on Diva, and Fitz contributed a lot more to fights uh, in terms of kills and applying pressure, which really helped to shut down Fleta, who, along with Void, have been a big part of the Dragon's success, especially when they're running that May sigma combination. If you watch that game uh, and the previous games where they run that combination, you'll see those two getting really aggressive and, like, being kind of the the, the linchpins of that team getting to really go aggro and get shit done. Uh, The Dynasty also just played cleaner than they did in the previous games, and they did a really good job when they broke out Dive on Control. I think they looked better on it than, uh, than Shanghai did. So do we think that this was a lot of coaching coming into play between the two weeks? I think it's a lot of coaching. It's a lot of, like, competitiveness. Um, It was a lot to talk about the mentality of these players, because like you said, it was a rough week, and you can it's easy to psych yourself out after that sort of situation. But they they came back, they looked good, and they were able to really play to their strengths and uh, pull out the win. Um, I, I think, you know, Shanghai just... I, I think Seoul just leveled up, and we'll see. Like, the thing is, Seoul right now um, has a lot of... They, they've had a lot of ups and downs as this season has uh, gone on for the brief time that they've been a part of it at this point. Oh, um, yeah. So we'll see if this is sort of a statistical outlier, um, if this kind of is... the direction they're trending in or if um or if they're just kind of a meta team which i I think would be kind of a shame considering the level of talent they have on their roster well we do have one match coming up for them next week where they face chengdu and that's anybody's game honestly yeah chengdu is in like you know there's there's the a tier the b tier the c tier so on and so forth they're they're in schrodinger's tier all tiers and no tier at the same time I think the best explanation of that, or at least my favorite that I've heard so far, when uh, Jake and I believe ZP were casting yes. the match this weekend for Seoul, 
for Soul for Chengdu, and ZP made the comment about you take a twenty sided die. You have most teams have a couple of numbers on that die. They have a range that you would expect them to be. Chengdu is any of them. Mm-hmm. And we've seen Chengdu's crit successes, and we've seen Chengdu's crit fails, and we've seen everything in between. So for me, that, you know, is a chronic tabletop player. Yes. That, I think, was a very apt metaphor. It could be anything. I think so. And it's one of those things that, like, even though I think they are more predictable now than they were last season, um, yeah. it's... You, you, there's definitely you. You can predict what they're going to do a little more readily, but at the same time, um, it's still Chengdu. Yeah, Who the fuck at, the, knows? at the same time, like whether or not they can tell their asses from their elbows seems to change, like by the phases of the moon. I don't like. Yeah, it, it's. It's ch- this is what made them so much fun to watch in the Blizzard Arena, especially when it was all goats all the time. They brought something different, and you never knew what it was going to be. It was always a surprise. They don't have quite as much of that, but their relative level of performance on any given week is mm. what brings that surprise. So they're going up against Soul again. Who the uh-huh. fuck knows? It could be um, literally anything as long as it fits in two 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 and doesn't have Tracer, May, Orisa, or Moira. Could be anything. Yeah, but with them and what they do, I, I think we have some th- th- some inklings. Like I said, they're more predictable now than they were in the past. Yeah. All right. I, I also want to talk a little bit about London. This is the first time that we've seen them play in 10 weeks. Yeah. After they completely, like, I think we saw them play one or two matches early on. And then we haven't really seen a lot of what this brand new roster can do. Mm-hmm. And then we see them 3 0 Chengdu. And then we see them get their shit wrecked by Guangzhou. And to be honest with you, that's kind of in keeping with uh, with what we've seen up to this point. Like the London been, tradition. They well, like yeah, there's that, but there. But the other thing is that like the their previous games this season, you know, they looked really strong in that first game against New York, and they never looked that good again. This is also true. And Guangzhou, oddly enough, is shaping themselves up to be the new New York. Yeah, well, the thing is, I, I do definitely, um, um, I do think a lot of people went into the season kind of sleeping on Guangzhou. Well, after last season, can you blame them? Yeah, but like, fair. But they were <laughs> they were trending better, and I think they made a lot of moves. It really shored up the roster and what it can do just because, you know, I, I've been on record as saying that I think, you know, Rio is a solid main tank, even if he doesn't, like, stand out in the way that a lot of other, you know, main tanks do. I think Krong is fucking crazy. We've, you know, we know their DPS line is nutty. We know that their supports are great. And it's just been a matter of can they bring all of this together to really make it deliver? And with you know the new coaching, uh, with the the new coaching staff, I think that they look really good. Like they've just, if they can keep this momentum up and keep this like level of play going, they're in a really good spot. So it seems to me like just from what we've been talking about, the APAC region is the one to watch this week or just yeah. in general, there's so much crazy stuff going on over there. Yeah. The one thing is just like we couldn't necessarily tell the the relative strength of Atlantic versus Pacific. Uh, it's hard to tell like Pacific versus APAC just because again, we really haven't seen uh, interaction between them and it'll be interesting to see what happens when that finally goes down because i feel like you know san francisco and 
uh, gladiators, especially like if they're the, you know, they look to be the top teams in sort of the America, Canada, NA region versus the, you know, APAC region, which is kind of isolated on its own. We don't really know how they stack up up there. Well, yeah, yeah, sorry, Philly, I forgot about them. But yeah, they, they, they would absolutely go up there. Although I, I don't think I would, I, I think I would put Philly third compared to those two. Yeah, I mean, in an orange on orange fight, I'm putting my money on the shock. Yeah, and but then again, the, putting your money on the shock tends to be the safe bet. Yeah, and like the only thing is, like the the game uh, against Dallas was very, very, very close. And ultimately, the thing that decided it more than anything was the fact that Funny Astro was able to keep out of the um, the way of Doha's EMPs very consistently. Yeah. If he wasn't able to do that, they would have lost that game, I think. Um, and we know right now that Gladiators can push a much higher tempo and just beat face in a way that Philly hasn't encountered yet, and we don't know how well they're going to do. But Gladiators beat Dallas a lot more convincingly, and while Dallas has leveled up since then, um, so I, I think the Gladiators have as well. And Shock, while they, they're, they're inconsistent, I don't think there's a team that can do sort of battlefield adaptations as well as they can. And I mean, you... You have to look at the shock roster, and I know we keep going back to this, and I know that we've recently lost Sinatra. Like, that's going to impact your roster. Oh, but yeah. everyone on that roster is a superstar, and I think at this point most people are looking at Moth. I would put Moth as probably the best support in the league. Like, fight me on that one. Just um... because of the way he's been performing, and performing extremely well making standout plays and performing consistently Mm -hmm. like i i would i'd make the argument that he is one of the best if not the best support in the league oh i definitely think he's in that top echelon i just don't know if i'd put him as the best who would you put as the best i don't know because like so because Jonak exists and we'd have to kind of go and sift through and go who's good, who's crazy, who's consistently good. Yeah, it's who yeah, it's who can pop off, who is most consistently good, who can save their allies the most. And then also like we we talked about Moth, Moth as a, you know, Moth as a shot caller and that's very valuable. There's a lot of intangibles as to, you know, who you'd have there and it's just a matter of like in terms of main supports, yeah, I think you've got a case. Overall, if you include the the flex supports, like the thing is, if I was going just who's the best main support in the league, thinking about it, it would be Moth. If Lee J. Gone was slightly more careful, I'd say he's on that list. Um, I'd put Big Goose there. Oh, absolutely. Um, now that Slime is back in the league, I put him in there. Um, I think that Funny Astro definitely deserves to be in that conversation. I think FD God looks really, really good right now. It's, um, yeah, the, there's a lot of people who I think give contention for that title in a different way, though I think the best two are probably Moth and Funny Astro. Yeah. And then I'd say Big Goose as well. I'd say those are my, my top three. I would agree. Supports are important. Love your supports, damn it. They keep you oh, alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't just say this as a salty support main. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a hell of a week. Um I think we're going to talk about the Titans a little more in depth and we can go into the performance of their roster then. And yeah, yeah, probably a little more about justice and the reason I cried on Saturday. So yeah, legitimately cried. No shame. (laughs) Yeah. So those are our results. And you know, we're, we're at this extremely high batting average, both of us, because 
Wow. First week back. Yep. Welcome back to the madness. So Pretty before much. we get before we get into the other three and a half pages of outline that are our <laughs> that's the news section because <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. We of course have a word from our sponsor. Uh, Fred's BS. Breads and spreads by Fred. Good things. Right now, because of coronavirus and because everything is a little crazy in terms of, you know, grocery shopping and delivering things and whatnot, he is currently only doing his brown sugar buddies. However, his brown sugar buddies are some of the best cookies I have ever had in my life. So, there's that. They're like a cross between a ginger snap in terms of flavor profile and a spice cookie. They are soft. They are chewy. They are unbelievably good. And I highly recommend either dunking them into your warm caffeinated drink of choice. If you are a coffee drinker, a tea drinker, a hot chocolate drinker, whatever it is, the really good in those. I also recommend putting jam and Nutella on them and then making a little sandwich, and then putting it in your face. Basically, they're amazing. You should absolutely order some. Highly recommended. And of course, he makes them fresh. Nothing is frozen. You can't find these in stores. He makes these in small batches just for you guys. Um, usually, I would say, if you live in Los Angeles, he does pickup instead of delivery, so you can get your goods even sooner. Given the way that things are, you might have to talk to him about that. I'm not sure if that's still on the table. But what is on the table is the discount code. So you go to fredhebakes.com, fredhebakes, three words, dot com, and enter the coupon code on the point for 20% off your entire order. So that is fredhebakes.com, coupon code on the point. Enjoy these cookies. They are amazing. Treat yourself. You deserve it. So Yes. We have, we have two weeks worth of news to talk about here. So we're yes. going to go over some of the older stuff that y'all know a little more quickly. The first thing on the docket is the Hero Pool revamp. And I had to laugh because we talked about this extensively on our last episode. What do we think of it? What would we do differently? Et cetera, et cetera. And then two days after we record it, because we tend to record these on Thursdays, they revamp the Hero Pool and do just about everything that we talked about. Yeah, so I love this. Literally, the only thing that I would change is make the hero pulls last like a month instead of a week. But, yeah, because it's hell on the teams. Oh, it's hell on the team, hell on the coaches, and I think just makes for a less high quality gameplay, you know, just experience. I disagree. I think it's entertaining as hell. Oh, but... no, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying the changes aren't good. I'm just saying the play is worse in terms of basically, again, just to go to the example of GOATS, because that, as much as it drove people crazy, that meta genuinely evolved and got so goddamn complex in terms of, like, there was an order in place for, like, how you should use your cooldowns. That is the level to which it was understood. And so teams that could actually play that really well, a.k.a. the Shock and the Titans, put on incredibly entertaining matches with an incredibly high level of gameplay. And while most people hate GOATs, I don't think most people hate those matches. If, if you have two teams playing at a very high level, it tends to be a very entertaining match. Um, just because you're seeing people do nutty things and pull off cool combinations and have a chance to develop uh, more pocket strategies that they can break out as opposed to teams having to rush to figure out the ideal combination of things and practice it enough that you know they're ready to sort of do it on the week within a, basically within like four days notice that said, we are starting to see some consistent comps. We we still see dual uh, we still see dual shield. We still see dive come out in several different iterations. The May Sigma is getting interesting. The May Reaper as well when that's in play. It's 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 not that you have to revamp everything every single week. There are some standards that change depending on the hero pool. 
I'm not arguing that it's not difficult for teams and coaches. I'm saying that you don't have to rebuild everything every single week. Yeah, but how much of what we're seeing is a matter of them going back to things that work rather than figuring out optimal, you know, rather than necessarily figuring out the absolute best thing through experimentation. Because we are, seeing, we are seeing things crystallize. Some of it is because, okay, we've done this. We know how to use this. And to a certain extent, you know, having things that we know how to do that are still at least somewhat optimal as combinations, that's great. If you're, um, but if you don't have time to experiment, if you've got four days to be ready to play a match against the fucking San Francisco Shock, are you really going to have that much, you really going to feel that good devoting time and energy into go into figuring out, you know, new shit when you need to be ready to rock? I mean, if you're not the Chengdu Hunters, probably not. Also, just as a record, just for the record, how many, like, inventive, weird plays have we seen this season? Because, like, in terms of iconic plays, you know, we've had the previous season's, like, <clears throat> great debate on uh, King's Row where the Gladiators pulled out that uh, big-ass rotation, you know, sort of pump-faking goats, and then Sherpore laid everybody out. We've had, you know... <laughs> Course he's not there anymore, but like Bumper's weird ass, you know, pins and stuff. I call that me Defran, crazy. I think it was the Defran the, play yeah, on the Zarya Defran on grab, Hollywood. Yeah, the Defran grab on Zarya. We haven't had like an iconic play, at least in my mind, as to this season yet. And I think part of that is just because teams do not have the ability to experiment to the same degree that they did in the past. But the flip side of that is I'm down for seeing impressive. Like I don't necessarily need to see here's a brand new strategy. No one's ever seen before. I am here for the McGravy 5k with the diva bomb. And then the follow-up that makes it a team kill. I am here for moth booping four people into the pit on the final point of King's row where the pit is two feet wide and you need to aim like I, I, the flip side of that is seeing these impressive plays that you know exist, but are hard to pull off without a good amount of finesse and setup. Yeah, but... I love I would... seeing the crazy creative plays, but I also enjoy seeing just stuff that we know is possible played at the highest level. And I agree with that, but I will counter by saying one of these doesn't need to preclude the other. This is we true. still saw those things happen in previous seasons, and that happens because these players are fucking good. If you want strategic creativity, you need them to have time to experiment and figure out stuff. And that's not going to make the other thing go away. I'm just saying I am happy with the other thing and I'm not willing to sacrifice. Let's be real. A lot of that creativity came with goats. And I know that you and I have very different feelings on GOATS meta, but I am excited by seeing a variety of different metas come out. I like the rotation. I like seeing new stuff week to week. You're, and I know it's frustrating and I know it's not great for everyone. And it's well, a personal preference. But I, I have, I'm not willing to sacrifice anything on the altar of this is our meta for the season. Good fucking luck. Well, notice I said a month and not never. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, prior to GOATS, do you know how often the meta changed? Like, because in, in Overwatch, like, especially prior to the League, there were absolutely metas that were around for maybe like a month or two and then just went away. GOATS lasted a ridiculously long time, yes, but that's not in any way, shape, or form like the standard of what metagame, like, of what, like, various metas over the course of the history of the game have been. That's just not the case. I know, but it lasted long enough to require changes like this because it was murder. Like, yeah, I, I know that, that it was has... the outlier, but it was also the outlier 
played at a professional level where they're trying to bring in new fans. Like I I can understand the balance issues behind it and I can understand the business decisions behind it. I'm just saying a week is way too small a window of time. Oh yeah, I'll give you that. But I'm, I'm saying I'm the not, opposite is I'm not willing to stick with a meta for a thousand fucking years when it's yeah, something like but, coats. But that's that's irrelevant because that's not what I'm suggesting. Anyway, hopefully we will like maybe after the May tournament we'll see another change in hero pools. Yeah, we'll, because we'll, we are we'll seeing, see how it goes. Yeah, because we, we are seeing public pushback from some coaches, some players, etc. talking about the difficulty level of adaptation and whatnot for them on the good point when you want to avoid burnout especially in the middle of a global pandemic and especially when let's be real the tier two scene is at an all-time low and if you burn people out you're not going to have talent to replace them especially not as much at the same level yeah so it's, I wouldn't be surprised if we get more hero pool revamps, that said. And we've got a list of the changes they made. Um, hero pools disabled for ranked starting on May 4th. Later on, they will be put back in for masters and upwards in comp. Mm-hmm. Um, data pulled only from Overwatch League matches from the previous two weeks, as opposed to pulling from all of comp. Um, we were back to the host picking the hero pools. And then this past week, they did it with the algorithm again, which pissed me off. Yeah. But here we are. I will say, I do like that it's in there for like master and masters and upwards, because I do think that that's a good thing Um, to a certain extent. It's just in lower SRs, most people suck at the heroes they play regularly. So forcing them off of those things and onto shit that they don't know how to play or don't want to play just makes their experience miserable. And then the other people in their match who are trying and are now frustrated out of their mind that, like, this guy who understandably doesn't know how to play a certain hero or whatever, but it doesn't change the fact that your game is suffering because someone doesn't know what to do and they're getting destroyed because of it. And that just leaves, you know, the person in that position frustrated because they can't play what they want and they're getting crapped on. And the people who are stuck with them frustrated because you're fighting 5v6, essentially, a lot of the time. I feel like this is something that only really starts mattering when you get to gold and plat, because I play in bronze where nothing matters. So, (laughs) I mean, yes, I 100% agree with you. I will also say that I never saw any of that when hero pools were happening, because again, I play in bronze. (laughs) Well, yeah, the difference is you would never know, because at that level, like a crappy Genji looks about the same as a crappy McCree. It's like you would, like... like bronze, the, bronze is quick play with more people on the mic. Yes. Is what I've discovered. Yeah. And you know what? I still have fun, and I still get really good people. And I occasionally oh, yeah. get some people where I'm like, all right, block, report, move on. Because oh, yeah, it's no, bronze. Trust me, I reported the absolute hell out of someone throwing in my comp game earlier today. Ah, Yes destroy them it's what they deserve anyway so this week's hero pool and we'll get into this again when we've got predictions is uh tracer may orisa and moira as chosen by the algorithm and i petition to get hosts and pets back to picking the hero pools because that brings me joy and is more random than an algorithm will ever be able to achieve yeah and it's Um, also yeah it's just fun it's just fun it is it's it's human fallibility you, you don't get people accidentally picking soldier three times when it's an algorithm. It's much more fun to just have the hosts or their pets or whatever do it live. Like, I love that. And it's that little bit of personality that I think really helps drive Overwatch League in the same way that they do little conglomerations is not the right word. Super cuts of weird or dumb shit the hosts have been saying when they're hosting at when they're hosting and casting at 1 a.m yeah like i i love it i love that they're just they're just embracing the the jank of it which i think is just fun because it uh 
it, it's just like people getting to be goofy and have fun and not worried about necessarily being professional or super crisp. Everyone's just enjoying themselves. And if so, if, you know, obviously if someone sucks at their job and they're having fun, it doesn't necessarily translate to a good product, but these guys are all good at what they do. And if they're enjoying themselves, that energy sort of infuses the, the product as well. That's half the fun of watching. See, I watch the APAC matches on VOD because yeah. if I stay up for them, I'm dead the next day and I don't enjoy that. But just watching this casting and knowing, okay, this match started at like 2.30 a.m. And knowing what it's like to be awake at 2.30 a.m. and trying to focus on something. And they have to do this and keep pace. And th- this is when we wind up with things like the Guangzhou spark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Bren talking about Tesco meal specials. Just it's it's completely insane. Bren and Sideshow specifically bring me so much joy. Right? Oh now. my god! Yeah, Bren especially like on the cast is just gold. A, he's just a font of chaos. Like I remember in the first season of Contenders, prior to the start of the Overwatch League, um, he and ZP were casting together, and they spent. Uh, a game pretty much like the entirety of a map just talking about what if questions between <laughs> between like fights basically <laughs> and it was just like would you rather have like would you like if you got a million dollars um but you had to like you could only play may or something like it was just weird shit like that I I feel like in most of our casting duos, you have the wild one and you have the slightly more grounded one. So like Jake is your grounded one and ZP is the wild one. And uh, Mr. X is your more grounded one in comparison to Uber. Um, You get to Brandon's sideshow, there is no grounded one. No. They are the Chengdu hunters of casters. They're just nuts. To be fair, there is a slight dichotomy because I feel like sideshow is just slightly less animated like he's slightly more low-key but you're still you're right like he's not the grounded one he's just the straight man yes this is still a comedy bit yes exactly yeah that that's that that's the best way of putting it that's bang on Every, everyone else has a grounded member and an animated member and then these two it's brennan sideshow like yep just yep Anyway, so yeah, the the casters bring me joy. I will continue to say that Janky Overwatch and Less Than Ideal Conditions is where you see the it's where you see the talent really shine. It's you see these people working with less than ideal setups and still busting their asses, and you can see how skilled they are and how hard they work. And that is a hill I will die on, mm-hmm. especially since we got to see what the spectators and what production looks like behind the scenes now that everyone's working from home. And I yeah. appreciate that they did that spotlight on them. And again, I will continue to say, janky Overwatch League is best Overwatch League. And this is where you see the people with skill and talent on the desk, on the casting side, and on the back end of things really shine. I don't know if I'd say it's best, but I fucking love it. I, yes, I adore it so much. Oh, no, I, I absolutely love it and enjoy the hell out of it. I just miss the I, I miss the hype of having like the crowd noise and reactions and the spectacle of the big venues and all of that. That being said, I, I really the, I, yeah I enjoy the the low key janky everyone's just having fun side of it just as much. They're, okay. they're, it's apples to oranges for me. And I mean I I will be honest I miss the Blizzard Arena. Oh God, me too. I, I just, I, I was talking with my therapist about, you know, well, you know, when you're feeling stressed, try to recreate a place that made you really happy. Try to recreate, mm-hmm. you know, what did it smell like? What did it sound like? Well, who's there? What are you doing there? And it used to be that I would recreate Main Street Disneyland. And now I've realized it's the Blizzard Arena. No. Oh, wow. One of yeah. these things still exists. So <laughs> it's just like, oh, yeah, no, that I really did love that place. Yeah, no, huh. it was it was it was special too because like as someone who kind of was a big esports like one of the things that kind of got me interested in this whole thing 
um, the the whole scene was like seeing it played on like basically hearing that it was played like on television in Korea, and I was just like, what the fuck? That's a thing. And then I see it, and it blew my goddamn mind. And then like my ability to go and uh, watch this was was kind of limited. And like any time I would go, it would be like. A, a small part of a bigger thing. Like I, I saw Starcraft tournaments in New York, but they were always part of like a convention. Like they weren't the main attraction. That's not what everyone was there for. And then there's this, which just took it to a whole new goddamn level. It was so fucking, it was kind of a, a, a weird dream come to life kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it was, it wasn't always, the best thing ever. You know, there's issues. There's It's freezing cold in there all the time. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, this is perfection. But it was wonderful. And yeah. it doesn't have to be perfect to be special. Oh, yeah. Which I believe is the tagline of this season of Overwatch and this podcast. It doesn't have to be perfect to be special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's no good segue for this, but let's talk about Vancouver. There's a lot to talk about here. Yeah, speaking of uh, special things that don't exist anymore. Uh, oh, 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 must you hurt me? Hey, you're the one who set me up for that segue. It's not my fault you didn't hop on it. It's the next thing on the list. We I know, but list. I know you gave me <laughs> you gave me the segue, the setup for the segue. You just didn't do it yourself. I set That's it up and you said. knocked me down. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's. So, yeah, Go yeah. Vancouver it. Titans, as you would have, as kind of predicted by my fucking rant last recording session, uh, the Vancouver Titans have released the entire roster, mutually parting ways with everyone except for Fisher, who was uh, released and picked up an entirely new roster. Jay Hong and Fisher said they're going to be taking a break from Overwatch, but they stressed up and down that this does not mean retirement for them. Um. As you can probably expect from all the drama, and you've probably seen some of it, uh, rumors of mismanagement have been swirling around the story. Um, and Kotaku, normally normally I don't really uh, point at something from Kotaku. It's like, this is good. But Kotaku released an article compiling a lot of these allegations, as well as um, detailing some new ones. First off, players were unhappy in their accommodations, which were... Uh, to, to quote the article, akin to small hotel rooms with concrete walls and little else, as opposed to the state-of-the-art facility the org had talked about in their post and the far nicer housing that they had in season two. Uh, the Titans org has said that the Toronto Raptor has said the Titans org who own the Toronto Raptors. Why did you edit that? That's not, sorry. The, 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 the sentence there got weird. Um, the Titans say, uh, the, the Titans org has denied that the living quarters are actually that bad, saying the Toronto Raptors practice out of the same facilities during the off season and don't have nearly as much of a problem with it. And, you know, everything's fine. It's not, it's not like a fucking jail cell or anything. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make the point here that the Toronto Raptors are, Probably can like Native Canadian or American, like they, or, they or lived Europe, here or European or uh, European. Canadian, yeah, people. My who, point is, they're yeah. adults. They speak English, and this isn't where they live twenty four seven. Yes, there's uh, the the culture shock is a lot less huge. Yeah, especially it, there's a difference between all right. Well, you know, I'm just using these facilities during the off season, or I'm only staying here for X amount of time. But I have this apartment or this house or this whatever. Yes. Like this is just kind of you're staying here for training purposes. It's not you live here. You wouldn't want to live in a hotel room. Like there's a difference. Yeah. Um, so next up, the team wasn't happy with their contracts either which the organization um, allegedly didn't renegotiate in any big way to reflect the team's great season two results. Um, Fisher and Jay Hong were also paid more than the rest of the team. Uh, the allegations kind of say that it was a fairly sizable gap, while the organization acknowledges that they were paid more, but says that, it, at least in their estimation, it wasn't a huge difference. Um, this might just be a matter of perspective. 
yeah. what one person thinks is a sizable game. Like, you know. Yeah, and to be fair, if I if I was the, you know, the old school Titan players, I I you know, I would probably be annoyed too if we got all the way to the grand finals, you fired one of our friends, brought on two new guys who admittedly are legends and probably are like respected and, you know, some of these guys, you know, they would have been excited to play with these guys. And you um and then they get more money than you, despite, you know, all the work that you put in. That, that kind of sucks. This is why it's good to talk about your salary with your coworkers. It keeps yes. management from pulling this shit. Yeah, they can. They and it's can't, not illegal. They can't fuck you. Or at yeah. least it's harder to do that. Yeah. Um, so Kotaku and a lot of rumors prior to the article say that the Vancouver Titans org pretty much left the team on their own to find housing in Korea. Um, the org denies this completely and uh, the players, the the org denies this. The players don't seem to uh, be denying these rumors at all, um, and they were apparently playing from their houses and apartments, basically, just like wherever they were playing. That's where wherever they were living. That's where the individual people were playing out of. Yeah. Uh, the team was played was uh, paid late. A point of contact was apparently incommunicado for like a month. Uh, the team hadn't really hired anyone to help the team uh, to help the the players, I should say, uh, adjust to being in a new country and help them acclimate. Uh, and the Kotaku article also alleges that Fisher didn't breach contract and the team just kind of made something up because they wanted to just take it back and start from scratch. But the org asserts that Fisher was terminated for a cause for what they didn't say. They just said, oh, yeah, he breached the contract somehow. And it's just. So the thing is, because of Fisher's track record, and I don't want to be like, oh, track record, he's a bad boy. But like the dude has failed to follow NDAs. He's been he's been a little bit of a loose cannon sometimes in terms of the finer point of contract. So uh-huh. I feel like this is something where the organization could say, oh, yes, he breached contract and there's been enough doubt in his past behavior that we can't be like, well, well like, my... we can't say that doesn't sound like him, mm-hmm. but also I'm not going to come out and be like, oh, well, obviously Fisher's the one that's lying in this scenario when the Titans org has a, uh... nah, just. Yeah, nah. my my only sort of counterpoint to that is also that, um there wasn't um why would they not give any sort of details or why was there not any sort of incident that someone could point to and say that yeah this is where he fucked up i can't think at the very least i can't point to anything and go like well clearly this is where he might have crossed a line at the very least the only thing i can think of for that is either what happened is under nda or it's mm-hmm. a finer point of the contract and they don't want parts of the contract going public for many a reason. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's fair. I'm I, just saying leaving say it vague. I'll say there's an argument to be made. I'll also say it's not worth making. Yeah, I, leaving it vague does not help the PR nightmare. But I mean, for a lot of this, it sounds like the Titans organization just wanted a well-playing team and didn't really consider the fact that they're people with that it's more than needs. a day one yeah that it's more than a day one investment yeah and that kind of um ties into uh runner and flower the people who founded and run the runaway organization they they had a stream sort of discussing things because you know these guys were their friends they lived with them and played with them and you know viewed them as family for years um and working from a translation here but they apparently said the vancouver titans players weren't even made aware of their schedule by the organization and had to play against Guangzhou and Chengdu with virtually no practice. Which is bonkers. It explains why they looked as bad as they did. Yeah. Um, and the thing about that stream that really, that really fucking hurt to watch was that they seemed to like blame themselves for how things worked out to a certain extent. Like the players all got individual offers for big money but everyone wanted to stay together. So they held out for a full team offer. And ultimately, you know, whether or not the contracts got bought out, like the buck ultimately stopped with Flowerman and Runner. 
Um, so the team wanted to stay, and instead of, you know, raking people off, they stuck together, and Vancouver was the only, like, um, real concrete offer they got. And, like, the organization seemed competent during negotiations and, like, a good group to address the team to, but the way things worked out, like, they never, they you know, they expressed frustration that the, the org never really went into the storied history of Runaway to build up the, um, to help sort of build the team identity. Like, they just didn't even touch on it. It's just, well, they're here now, and yeah. Um, and then other teams wound up building the identity for them in the fan art and whatnot that we got, and we wound up yeah. with the Titans as Thanos. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, but... Yeah, they said straight up, the way that things worked out, um, if they had thought that it would go this way, they never would have accepted the offer and would have let people go off on their own. And despite the fact that Runaway still exists, it feels like something in that magic, like a part of it kind of died with this whole debacle. Yeah, it's kind of hard not to feel that when the people in charge of their well-being fuck it up that badly. Yeah, especially like, when you were the people that were trying to be responsible and do right by your players. Like, to my understanding, and, and this could be, you know, grain of salt, could be a rumor. But to my understanding, the Titans organization didn't have a translator on board until several months into season two. Which is just so goddamn insane. It is pants on head stupid yeah yeah it's um anyway on to another one of their yeah. fuck-ups. let's uh let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about the roster they signed so, and the yeah. fuck up being the person that they tried to sign that didn't go through everyone else seems to be okay yeah so basically um the roster that they picked up is um, Shredlock on main tank, KSAA on off tank, Dalton and Suna on DPS, and Rolf and Karkar on support. Rolf being the main support, or being the flex support, Karkar being the main support. Um, the core of this unit is from a team called Second Wind. They've been a, um, a frequent presence in uh, NA contenders for a very long time, and a lot of players have come in and out through sort of their... Um, through their organization over the span of time. They've had a lot of different roster iterations. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but KSAA is from Saudi Arabia, isn't he? Yes, he is. He is, I believe, the only uh, player from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the Overwatch League, which is cool. So, I'm always for more diversity and more representation of the world. Yeah, the like, world. I will give them this. Good on them for picking him up. Yeah, and there are some genuinely talented... Uh, players from the Middle East in European contenders because they kind of get folded into Europe as far as contenders organization goes. Yeah, just geographical proximity. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, Second Wind was the core of the new lineup. Um, and this could have been very problematic due to a player they wanted to sign initially and who ultimately not being able to sign them is kind of what seems to have prompted the signing of KSAA. Uh, and the player in question goes by Hegan, uh, formerly known as Kaluge, who uh, is known for playing as uh, a part of Second Wind under the previous idea of Kaluge, as well as being on the team of the infamous uh, GOATs, the people who came up with the comp. Um, which is why they call it that. Yeah, it was a team called GOATs, and it was the composition that they ran in tournament, so it just got called GOATs comp. Yep. A lot but, of yeah. comps get named like that. Honestly, not as many get named after teams. Like, Didn't Clockwork Vendettas get... Then again, yeah, that but... is the widely run comp. Well, yeah, Clockwork Vendetta was, you know, a different story because they were the, like, the only ones playing that at first. And even then, you know, it gets... Part of it was just being, you know, Overwatch League tried to call it, like, ice fishing or something just to differentiated from you know naming it after the this team yeah. um and goats you know they, is goats is goats yeah well they, they, they tried to call goats 3-3 but nobody went nobody went for it um yeah. 
but yeah um so yeah Kaluj, uh he again previously had a reputation for, has previously had a reputation for being immensely toxic with highlights including harassing female players in his games throwing games when he cues into players he doesn't like uh boosting trading wins on ladder um shouting a uh specific phrase uh I, when I, throwing I out a, his hollow ak- a hollow akbar i was trying to avoid it um yeah yeah, sh- yeah. Shouting a specific phrase when he uses diva self-destruct um so basically just being horrifyingly i'm not sure if that's racist or if that i'm not sure islamophobic at the very least islamophobic is the best yes thank you basically holy shit no just yeah and he was previously previously banned from contenders and released from second wind uh because he breached tos by doing all of this shit uh and he's kind of been out of the spotlight since all this happened and has allegedly made efforts to clean up his act I can't confirm any of that because I haven't followed him closely after all this happened. And in attempts to do research for this, both Twitter accounts that I've known as belonging to him seem to have been deactivated. In the interest of playing devil's advocate, you know, he stayed out of the community news for doing this shit. And Gator, who was banned alongside him for similar toxicity, has cleaned up his act. However, actions speak louder than words. Gator's been on the stage. Gator hasn't fucked up. And without seeing some concrete evidence of change, I'm taking any, you know, word about Hegan slash Kaluja's change of behavior with just, I'm cracking the lid off of my fucking salt shaker. Well, and I'm sitting here going, Satan doesn't need any more advocates. Satan does his own work. Quit fucking advocating for Satan. Uh, Not you, just in general. Yeah, no, like, I'm I'm not saying give the guy a chance. I am acknowledging that the people in the scene are young and stupid and genuinely do a lot of shit very visibly on a platform when they don't know any better. But at the same time, I, I say, like, it's... I've done, I, I have done some dumb shit in my past that I'm glad was not streamed or put up anywhere. Nothing like that. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the... I'll say for this, because I know there's a lot of cancel culture gone wrong, and if you say one wrong thing ever, you know, people losing jobs over tweets they did 10 years ago, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, it's one thing to behave like this. It is another thing to realize that what you're doing is slash was wrong And to be able to come out with an actual apology, not an I'm sorry you were offended apology, but an actual I understand that what I did was insensitive, was this, was that, etc. I want to sincerely apologize to and then naming the people that you have wronged. Like there's you can see in an apology whether or not someone gets it. Yeah. Like if you want a good example. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, if you want a good example of that. Dan Harmon, the creator of Community and um, and Rick and Morty, a um, person on his writing staff accused him of sexual harassment, that he came out and said, yeah, I did that. Here's everything I did. Here's why I did what I did. It was wrong. It was stupid. I'm sorry, and I'm trying to be better. And I apologize to you specifically because I know what I did hurt you and made your life harder. Yeah, and there's you can choose whether or not to forgive a person. Like yeah. that is a hundred percent your call. Oh, yeah. We're not saying, oh, they apologize, so you have to forgive them. That's not no. no, that's not that's not how this works. But you can tell from an apology whether or not someone understands, truly yeah. understands why what they did was wrong. And anytime it gets into I'm sorry you then it's a problem. If it's, I'm sorry you were offended. I'm sorry if people got yeah. offended. I, that, that's that's not an apology. So yeah, it's, yeah you're not... putting you're putting the onus on other people for having the reaction they did instead of you saying, okay, why did they feel that way? Yeah, exactly. So it's, and again, it's a hard thing to do when you're young. You really don't have that perspective on the world. The internet, you, you feel like you have to put on a face, put on a persona. There's a lot of different layers to this but i have not seen an apology like that 
from Coluge. I don't know if he mm-hmm. has made an apology. I don't know if he's made like an actual public apology or if it's just people saying, well, he said he's sorry. The only one that I had specifically found was from very close to the incident and was, you could tell, very much written by an angry young person. Oh, boy. So, so the only one I yeah. could find was at the t- was like made at the time and probably a little too impulsively. So maybe yeah. he put a more heartfelt thing out there at some point. I don't know, but I can I can't find anything of it because everything I can find uh, that belongs to him on social media is like gone. is gone. Like, the last thing that I can find from him. Or wait. No, he posted something new. Holy shit. Yeah, no, wow. When? May 10th. That's not exactly breaking news, but I'll take it. Let's hear it. Hello, Overwatch community. So there's been quite a bit of speculation about my status over the past week. First off, I don't blame anyone for posting my mistakes from two years ago. Whether I like it or not, they're a part of my past, and I need to accept that no matter what I do. Some people will never forgive me for uh, things I said. Uh, I need to accept that no matter what I do, some people will never forgive me for things I said. But that won't stop me from trying. I took a break from Overwatch over a year ago to improve upon myself and my mentality. I spent the time growing up, and when I came back, I started playing competitively again. I joined Wavecheck, and soon after, I joined Second Wind, and I can't thank them enough for giving me a chance. So many people still see me as the immature 18-year-old on stream, but they took uh, a chance on me having changed, and I'm grateful for it. I was able to show my teammates and the people I interacted with that I had improved on who I was, but the greater public hasn't seen that. I heard what people had to say about what I did, and I spent time and effort on working on myself to try and become a better person, but it still hurts to see people who still see me as who I was when I was 18. Over this past weekend, I watched my teammates play on the Titans, and I can't say, and I can't help but feel I've let them down. Maybe if I didn't have the history that I do, I could be on that team right now helping them win, and I have no one to blame for that other than myself. I earned the opinions people have of me through my actions, and I hope one day to earn people's trust again. That I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to compete with Second Win this past week, but I'll be returning uh, this coming week of Contenders. This hasn't stopped me before, and I won't let it stop me now. I will continue to improve upon myself day by day. Maybe one day people will see that I've grown past the person I was two years ago. I'm human. I've made mistakes. I'm not asking for anyone's forgiveness. I will earn it. For now, it's back to the grind. On the one hand, that sounds a lot more mature. That really does. On the does. other hand, I didn't hear the phrase, I'm sorry. It's weird. I, like, I'm willing to give him some brownie points for what seems to be a genuine apology acknowledging his mistakes and that no one owes him forgiveness or anything like there's some genuinely i think signs of growth in there i I think you're right i also think the league did the right thing by uh not approving his contract yes um yes uh vancouver titans uh allegedly still extended uh, him a contract offer, and the league did not approve it. And that is why he was not picked up. Yeah, with with everything that was going on around it at the time, I can see why they wouldn't want to do that, especially when with all the different changes being made and with things being insane because COVID-19, I can see why they wouldn't want to purposely bring on any more negativity, especially I'm, since there is so much negativity around the Titans organization right now for good goddamn reason. I'm surprised the Titans organization offered him the contract in the first place, to be honest. Are you really? Well, here, Are the, you really? The reason is they're already in a shitstorm of bad PR. They're all the, the the fuck train has no brakes for the Vancouver Titans right now. You would think somebody would go, hey, this guy was known for, as previously stated, shouting Allahu Akbar every time he threw out a diva bomb. And you know, there are clips of him all over just blaming the fuck out of female players and saying, all right, this guy's in, it's time to fucking throw and then doing it and all of that stuff. 
you think somebody would be like, maybe this is not the time we want to take that chance. I counter with, this is the organization that bought an entire Korean team and then supposedly didn't bring on a translator and didn't really understand that these are people that need to be taken care of, allegedly. To, it seems to me that they saw skill level and went, I want that, regardless of the human that the skill level is attached to. So with that viewpoint, why wouldn't you extend it to a talented player, even though he's got a lot of skeletons in that closet? Like... I can see why they did it. That doesn't make it a good decision. Yeah, I um, I agree. I have no faith in that organization. Yeah, no. I, 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 the thing is, I, I don't tend to have faith in the common sense. I tend to have faith in the instinct of protect one's own ass. I don't think they understand how to do that in this in this environment. Like, I legitimately don't think they get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's that um I will yeah. also and i want to talk about this a little bit because it's sort of a birds of a feather thing yeah when there was talk last week about Coluge being signed and his history coming up and whatnot one of his big defenders was dogman on the atlanta rain and given that at the time we couldn't find anything on his social media, we had clips, we had other people's experiences, but we didn't have anything directly from him. Again, this apology came out after all of this. It's one thing, like, Dogman came out and said, what, nobody's allowed to make mistakes. He made a mistake. He's gotten better. Is no one allowed to get better? Like, that sort of thing. I understand that mentality. My issue is... It was coming from Dogman. And there's, it would be one thing if it was like Mickey or Custa or someone who generally has a more positive level attitude or like Jake saying, hey, he's changed, give him a chance. Because they, these are people who have gotten where they are on force of personality and skill, but personality they're anchors of their team they're emotionally intelligent like these are people where they say hey i vouch for that guy you take their word on that because you have a measure of their character dogman's public persona cruz is a feeder wearing the clown wig like i'm not gonna sit here and say that dogman is a bad person because one i don't know him personally and two i don't think your public persona can be used as a measure of you as a person, especially when you're young, especially when you're on a stage. Like, that flips different switches in your brain. Yeah. I will say, again, this is the guy who triggered Cruz as a feeder and stands up and yells at the audience if they're wearing the colors of the team that they're playing against. And, like, things like that. When he's known for this sort of behavior, him standing up and saying, hey, this guy who's a feeder and a harasser and Islamophobic and misogynistic, he's changed. Give him a chance. Carries no weight. Yeah, Just it, none. It, uh, it loses some punch. Uh. <laughs> like, like, again, it's one thing if it's someone whom you know is a good person, a chill human who, you know, their, their personality is cultivated on that as opposed to, again, I don't know what Dogman's like off stage or in real life. I don't. I don't know him as a person. I'm not his friend. Like, I can't vouch for that. But when you've cultivated a public persona of here is my clown wig, it, mm -hmm, when you try to be serious, people will always read that off your public persona. So here we are, I guess. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I'm all for giving people second chances, you know, to a certain extent. But the thing is, when people cross certain certain lines, um, you need to realize that not that that you need to show evidence of growth before you earn that second chance. Like, someone asking for forgiveness does not mean that they have necessarily earned it. Um, and so you, the, the whole, like what, no one's allowed to make mistakes. People absolutely are. That happens all the time. Like I said, I've done some shit that I'm not proud of that I look back on and wish I hadn't done. 
Oh. At the same time, um, like I said, I didn't do any of that. And I didn't do it publicly and repeatedly and all of that stuff. Um, and it's just one of those things of if you want people to think of you differently after that, you need to show them that you are different. And right now, be, because he admittedly has done an admirable job of staying out of headlines, we don't know that. No one outside of people who have directly interacted with him have any knowledge of that. And His so public persona is frozen it's from all, what we saw two years it, ago. It's all we have to go on um, outside of people who interact with him directly or who followed him more closely than, you know, than we did. That's all we have to go on. So, you know, I'm, it's not necessarily like, it's not necessarily guilty until proven innocent because he did the things. Yeah. It's right now showing that he has learned from that and demonstrating it. And I think that apology is a good first step, but there are more steps to that process to showing that you have grown as a human being to the point where people are willing to sort of accept you in that way. Yeah, and it, I, I agree with you that it's a good first step. I would, I say this as someone who, you know, gets maligned fairly regularly when playing games and just, you know, being yeah. in, being a woman in public, full stop. Yeah. And that's one aspect of the shit he pulled. I'm a white, lapsed Catholic woman, so there's a lot of other stuff that I avoid just by virtue of you know the genetic lottery so i'm yeah i'm not gonna say that i know everything about that but i'm also going to say that the lack of direct apology to the people he hurt bothers me the, this the yeah, lack of yeah. i'm sorry i hurt you i'm yeah. sorry i perpetuated stereotypes i'm yes. sorry i did x like the the lack of apology coupled with i will earn their forgiveness is like mm, buddy you got a ways to go yeah, that's that's one of like admirable sentiment, but the thing you need to to step one is acknowledging, and you've acknowledged that you did some bad things. You haven't said what and why and all of those things, and so that to, that that definitely loses you some points in terms of you showing that you have changed as a person and that you are you know, that you've grown past that. Like you, you don't get to stop at step one. Yeah. Not to, if you want to get anywhere. To go back to the, the Dan Harmon example, which the, the reason I keep bringing that up is because the person who brought all of this to, um, who, who made the, the allegation that he responded to said that she accepted his apology. And it was like something people should look to um, as sort of a masterclass in how to apologize and demonstrate a desire for growth. Um, that's why I keep harping on that one specifically. But yeah, he, he straight up said, this is what I did. Yes, everything she said was true. This was it. This was what was going through my head. It was wrong. It was stupid. I wish that that hadn't been the case and I'm trying to change that about myself. There were specific acknowledgments of the wrong and then what was being done to change that. Yeah. And there's there is an art and a practice to being able to see what you fucked up and understanding why it was a problem and crafting an effective heartfelt apology like this is not something that people do off the bat this is skills that need to be learned and he started on that path but again that's step one he needs to keep going absolutely so yeah so that's that let's let's talk about the performance of the new lineup yeah so like i said shredlock and ksaa on the front line dalton and suna as your dps core and then rolf and Karkar as your back line so far they have not really inspired confidence. And I think part of that comes from the fact that they are now up against the higher tier of competition than they have ever played against before. 
um, and they are, you know, they quite literally couldn't have adequate preparation for that because this has been a very rapidly evolving situation. And part of it is the fact that this roster has been put together on very short notice. Dalton, Shredlock, and Rolf were all picked up from the same roster, from Second Wind. But Suna, Karkar, and KSAA are all from different teams. Um, and furthermore, I don't want to badmouth these guys, because they're in a really shitty, you know, in a shitty spot. And I do think a lot of members of this roster have potential, and some, you know, I don't know that much about. Like, I haven't seen KSAA play before now. Um, I, I think don't he was know on Team Saudi Sina. Arabia during a yeah, World well, Cup. Yeah, but uh, having been at uh, BlizzCon for that, it was very, very hard to see all the games when this you're there in person. Um, so I, I genuinely don't really have much that I can contribute to that. Um, but a lot of these guys, throughout the performances that I have seen, never really struck me as like the absolute top tier of their role in tier two overwatch um when i was when i was watching it like they need to evolve if they want to succeed because in overwatch league pretty much every single role is immensely stacked you're going to be facing the highest possible level of competition coming back at you um better than average is not going to cut it against incredible and these new titans are going to need to rise to the occasion by growing as players not allowing the early hurdles that they're facing by the very nature of their formation, not allowing the added pressure or, or, or the fandom vitriol due to the fact that they're replacing a very beloved roster after a very ugly split. They need to let, they need to not let all of that break their mentality because they've got a long fucking season ahead of them. They I really be, do. I would be very surprised if there weren't some new additions being made here but right now i don't want to necessarily give like a thumbs up or a thumbs down on everything here because these guys are coming in in one of the worst circumstances you could be asked to come in and do this um and the thing is to my understanding it's really hard to get up to league level from tier two like you have to wait for a spot to open so you're in tier two you're looking at pro and suddenly someone comes to you and says, hey, we want you to join this team. My God, you jump at that. You don't go, well, your management of your last lineup wasn't really as good. You just go, fuck yes, I'm in. Because also, who, knows, org, when, also, yeah, who knows when you're going to have you're another with, opportunity. And if the org you're with right now, because Second Wind, you know, they have contracts. If another organization buys out your contract, what are you going to do? Yeah, so I'm... What I appreciate, because this went around Twitter when the Titans dropped their roster, but before they announced who their new roster would be, what I appreciate is a lot of people going, hey guys, as Overwatch fans and Overwatch League fans and Titans fans, we're going to promise not to be shitty to the new roster just because they're not the same as the old roster. The players aren't the same as the management. Don't be shitty to the new guys. So I don't think that all of fandom got that notice because not all of fandom runs in the same circles on Twitter that we do because Twitter is huge. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate that that sentiment was going around at all. Like, yeah. I like that fans who are that invested are able to separate the management issues from the T2 players who are shooting their shot. Yeah. And that said... I would like to see how they play once they've had more than 48 hours together to practice, you know, yeah. like I think looking ahead at who they're facing this weekend, who do we have? They're against Philadelphia, which is let's be real, not going to be a great showing because it's Philadelphia and they're against the outlaws, which might be a little more even in their favor. So we'll, we will see. I do think that they will improve once they've had more time to work together and get some synergy. I oh, also yeah. think that, again, we had them against the Justice and we had them against Florida. 
Justice had a specific situation in that they lost Corey and it was Stratus's last match. So you know they're going to go balls to the walls for this is our player's last match. We're going to do the best that we can. Florida is no longer a bottom of the barrel team like they were for the first two seasons. Mm -hmm. So I hesitate to say like, well, yeah, they lost to the Justice and well, yeah, they lost to Florida when they took a map off the Justice. They fought like hell against Florida and Florida's not bad anymore and the justice were firing on all cylinders because you want to give a beloved team member a good send-off yeah there was added pressure for them to perform oh yeah so yeah so i'm i'm willing to withhold judgment for i want to say a couple weeks yeah and it it frustrates me to like the support line especially have been getting a lot of shit um and it frustrates me because like one again they're coming in in a really rough spot they're needing to go a long way towards building um you know synergy and developing a coaching structure like all these things that are very 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 important in terms of you know becoming a successful functioning team at any level much less the highest possible level and these guys can't perform. Car Car um, has previously played with um, Atlanta, uh, with um, Atlanta Academy, and uh, with Fusion University. And I believe he was with Fusion University when they went on their excursion to Korea. Um, let me double check that right now because I know he played with them in like the Gauntlet. Such. Was he? I feel like there was one person on Fusion University that didn't go, elk. and I feel like that might have been him. It was Elk. It was Elk. Thank you. I'm gonna say I remember it was someone whose name I recognize. But yeah, I think there is potential in this team, but I think we're not gonna see it till like we're, we're not gonna get a good idea of what they're like when they can really work together until I want to say late June, early July. Like we need yeah. to give them time. Other people had time in the off season. They don't. Okay. Quick correction. Um, Karkar did not go with them to Korea. He played with them in uh, Contenders 2019 uh, NA Season 1. And in, um, I believe, in the Atlantic Showdown as well. Yes. Um, so he played with Fusion University for a time. Faced some very high-level competition. Um, he's, you know, he, he can do things. And Rolf, motherfucking Rolf, I was genuinely really happy to see him finally getting a shot in the Overwatch League. Because, you know when this dude uh, started playing um, Overwatch professionally? June of 2016. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's been he has been going for a really long time. Like so the team that um he was most well known for playing uh, up until he like joined Gladiators Legion and that, but he was um he was part of the the North American uh roster of of uh, of Cloud9. Oh. Which is where we get sure for and where we initially got gods. And, you know, you know, a bunch of recognizable names. He's been and that's a also, for those of you who don't know, where we got the term C9. Yes. Um, and he's also, he was on Team Canada, I think, two or three times. I think you're right. I know it was 2016, 2017. I forget if he was there for 2018 as well. I think that might be when they kind of traded up for, for Banny. Um or Crimzo. Um, I mean, but Banny, though. Yeah. But, yeah. um... So, my... There's there's some promise in this team. It's just going to take a chunk of time until we see it. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately where they're going to be depends on a lot of factors right now. Like, all those things that I just said. And also, you know, the fact that COVID-19 and lockdown yeah. and quarantine and only, so many things like... Only fucking stuff up more. So yeah, keep an eye on the Titans. 
understand that there is a difference between the Titans, the players, and the Titans, the management, and that one of them deserves all of your love and support, and the other one, uh, yeah, stop. The other one, your mileage may vary. <laughs> to, be, yeah. to be diplomatic, you you all know. There's a it. lot of the other one allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, we're gonna do the my favorite murder thing and just say allegedly. Yes. So, uh, moving on from Vancouver, because we do a few other things to cover. Uh, as we talked about before, Kellex retires, and to um, pick up the slack, the um, the defiant recruit Cruz. So we've got Cruz over there now, and uh, like we said, so far that move seems to be working out well for them, and we'll see how that goes as he continues to integrate and become a part of the team. The Washington Justice have lost both Corey and Stratus, with Stratus playing his final match um, for the Justice uh, this past weekend or the week? Yes, this, yeah, this, this past, past Saturday. Uh, essentially, it's a favor because he wasn't initially scheduled to play. Yeah, evidently the organization asked him and he said, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. I cried more yeah. than once. Just, just cried. It's, it's again, we talk about players who build their reputations based on force of personality. And god damn if Stratus isn't just chaotic good to the bone. Yeah. And he, it, I'm gonna I'm I know he's staying on with the justice for content creation. And so this isn't the last that we see of him, and this isn't the last that we see of him in context with this team, but god damn I am going to miss that man. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It it sucks to see him go, but like with everything going on, it can I can only imagine how hard it is to, to find motivation um, to just keep doing what you're doing, especially because, like, this is something we've talked about before, like, many moons ago, but being a professional in Overwatch requires so much more grinding than it does, like, consistent grinding to, than it does to be a pro in most esports. Just because one very wide pool of characters and abilities and kits, very wide pool of maps, constant you know fluctuation of balance changes, uh, you know a lot of balance changes. Um, there are so many factors that you know require you to be just constantly practicing if you want to stay at the highest level possible. And that's one of the reasons we see so many people burn out. Much yeah. like uh, we, we see people talking about like they're just tired and there's a lack of passion. And, you know, as another example of that, Gray. Because uh, I, Gray... I, I will say I did I did read the twit longer that Stratus put up because, yeah. of course, I did. And he mentioned that it was less being burned out on Overwatch League and more passion for content creation and he's got the opportunity and he's gonna shoot a shot and you know yeah. he it's getting into content create content creation is hard oh, and God, he's yeah. just he, he's he's a meme lord shitbird and he's naturally good at it there's just oh, something about his personality yeah, his comedic timing his editing like he's already got the skill set for that oh, and yeah. he has the opportunity to do that with an organization where there's already a built-in fan base, we're already familiar with his style and his comedy. Like, this is probably going to be the best opportunity for him to switch lanes and pursue something that can see you far beyond Overwatch League because he's he's young. Like, oh my god, he's yeah. young. Yeah, so, and I, I think it really is a, a great lane for him to try and just see how far he can follow. Like he's Absolutely. like you said, he's so naturally suited to it. Yeah. So this, I think this is one of the few where it's less burnout and more okay, but I like this more. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I think that's part of it. Yeah, but yes, the, the sh shifting back to it. Yeah, Gray Gray he memed his retirement, didn't he? Yeah, he pretty much just copy pasted uh, Eeps. Kellex's. I thought it was Eeps. It was, you're right, it was Heap. Yeah, Kellex wasn't on his team. That's true. Brain. Where is the brain? It's not here. Quarantine's fun, guys. Yeah. 
So Gray memes his own retirement. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he has stepped down and retired. And Paris Returnal, uh, Returnal, Paris Eternal, in response, picked up <laughs> Fielder from GC Busan Wave, a team in Korea, uh, which is also where we got Edison. Uh, and so far, he has looked to be a really, really good pickup for them. He has popped off a lot in the matches that he has uh, been in there with and played pretty damn well with the team for someone who is playing from Korea with very limited time to integrate himself into the roster. At 200 ping at four in the morning. Yes. Like my dude, that is hardcore. Yeah, Fielder Fielder has kind of earned some fucking G status from this shit. It's genuinely so, really impressive. Oh, yeah. And he, he was playing Anna, correct? Uh, Anna and Moira. Yeah, so playing Anna and hitting those shots and hitting those sleep darts you know, at 200 ping. He sleeps, too. Yeah, so this... When he is Paris... The Paris Eternal team, do we know where they're currently located? Are they in France or are they still stateside? Do we you know? know? I I don't know. I have, have no idea. It might be posted somewhere. If you know, put it in the comments. I don't know. Yeah, let us know. But regardless, it will be interesting to see how he does, what changes, when he gets to be where the rest of the team is and integrates a little bit more. Because if he's playing yeah. like this on 200 ping from Korea with teammates he hasn't had time to practice with, holy shit, y'all. Hell yeah. No, I'm, I, I think there's, uh, I knew Fielder was good. I didn't know he was, was this good. This is. And now we genuine. know. Yeah. Um, fuck. Um, speaking of pickups, we have another one, um, because Boston has lost because Boston. another player. Brosson has retired and Boston has signed a uh, punk off tank of Sydney Drop Bears uh, Uprising Academy in Team Australia of 2018 and 2019 to play off tank for them. Therefore, we add another Aussie to the league. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. We lost one to the desk and now we're picking one up. Pretty much. Our Aussie quotient, um, quotient must stay at one. <laughs> they, they need, they, they're, there can be only one. Because um, yeah, we, I feel like we had a second one at some point, and they're not in the league anymore. I don't know why. Like, I feel like we had a second Australian player, and I cannot, for the life of me, remember who it is. Now I'm curious because Color Hex is a Kiwi. He's from New Zealand. Uh, yeah, and I keep thinking Jaws, but isn't Jaws is Jaws British or Jaws is he British and a caster? And Uber I, know, is... I know he's a caster. Yeah. Give me some oh! credit. Trill. Trill. That's what I was thinking. The smasher Trill. of good olds himself. Okay. That's, that's, I could have sworn, because I know there was a big hubbub around it when he got signed, and I'm like, is it Trill? And I'm like, oh, or is yeah. Trill yeah, just no. sticking in no, my no, mind? No, Trill, Trill is awesome. Okay. I know he was sticking in my mind because half of my Overwatch League Twitter circle just completely lost their shit when he was signed. So it's oh, like, yeah, no, he's, oh, yeah, he's no, great. I remember him. Um, yeah. He's great, and I'm happy he's there. Yeah, they yeah. Did, which you okay. kind of got to do more. But, um, so, so for a minute there, Trill was, there can only be one. Yes, uh, yes. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how he performs, because right now, I don't think Brisson was necessarily the problem, and we'll see, you know, if Punk proves to be a mechanical upgrade or a lateral step. The problem is just everything else about this team in terms of, their play and strategy and cohesiveness. <laughs> they have a lot of shit to work on. I feel like every season has that one team where you're just sitting there like, oh, oh my God. No, I want to see, like, you're kind of the gimme, but also I really want to see you do better. Season one, it was the Shanghai Dragons. Season two, it was, well, for a little bit there, it was the Valiant, let's be real, but we grew out of that. It was well, Justice and we, it was we, Florida. We yeah, I was going to say, we have a rotating door of them. Justice has kind of stayed in that fucking category right now. They Boston, were doing so much better at the end of two, and now it's like... 
Boston started off looking at least okay and then just swan dived off a fucking cliff. Boston started season two as the masters of the reverse sweep. And yes. then they lost that. Yeah, well, the yeah. thing is, like, Boston's record in season two was eight and 20. Like I said, they started off as the masters of the reverse well, sweep. Well, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is they started off kind of strong, because remember, each of the uh, stages had seven games, and they started off four and three. So I just want to point out, in stage one, they got more than half of all of the wins that they were going to get. And they got another three in stage two, which constituted, you know, yeah, and then only one in stage three, none in stage four. Boston started off kind of strong and then just nosedived off of a cliff. And they need a lot of, they need so much to change right now to be successful. I, I find myself wondering how Fusions feels because there was that trade in place with the Valiant that the Valiant organization called off at the 11th hour. Oh, he, Like yeah, they I, were having a going away dinner for Fusions when Valiant called and said, actually, never mind. And I'm like, you know, there are some things you just never forgive your team's management for. And that's one of them. So I have to wonder how Fusions feels seeing Valiant over the middle of the season got their roster bring in a bunch of new people like fusions could have been where gig is now and valiant is on an upswing they're not yeah. perfect they're not the best but they're they're the stonks are rising so i just i got a feel for him like he was almost there valiant called it off and you you couldn't have known at the time oh no but there's, now, yeah there's n- it would have been difficult to predict and especially because like I, I think fusions is one of the brighter spots on that roster right now. oh absolutely um no question and it has to be maddening because we've on stage you can see how upset she's getting stomped on repeatedly makes him it, he's not happy at least he doesn't look to be happy I mean, that doesn't feel good. And knowing that you're part of the team that's like, yeah, we're the gimme team. We're the, oh, someone else is playing us? Well, then they're going to win. We're the people are setting fucking records against us team. Currently, again, Guangzhou holds that record against Seoul, but the Valiant nearly broke it this past weekend. And if they had full held Boston on point A of uh, King's Row, they would have. Also, weren't they the first team to uh, give up a win to the Shanghai Dragons? Was it Boston? I think. I'm gonna I'm gonna check right now. Yeah, you 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 go check in, and I think at this point, just God bless them. You know, I I have to wonder because we had this for Shanghai, and people started rallying really hard around Shanghai at towards the end of season one. Like we really do want to see them get a win. Um, I think Florida had an uptick in fans, especially after they came out with their third jersey and especially after bare hands left. I wonder if Boston is going to start getting more people on board for that underdog, we want to see them get a win mentality. They were and I the feel first like... team to drop a map to drop a match to the Dragons. They were? They were. Ouch. Week two. Oof. So I, I, I feel like I, I feel like that support for them isn't as strong when you don't see the face cams, when you don't see the players face to face. Like there is something missing with not having face cams on the broadcast and we're all yeah. missing that a lot. But I wonder if they aren't going to start picking up more fans just like, come on, Boston, just take one, just do something. It'll be interesting to see them face the Titans if slash win they eventually do. Mm-hmm. Just to see where that goes right now with a roster that's having issues. And I will say it, Mufin was a solid player. I'm very glad that they did the right thing and dumped his ass because of the awful shit that he did. You're still losing a piece of the puzzle that you needed and you have no extra people right now. Like I'm saying 
it's the right decision. I'm also saying that hurts them in terms of gameplay. And I can appreciate that the organization yeah. did the right thing, knowing that it would hurt them in terms of gameplay. And the other thing worth mentioning in that is prior to people finding out what he did, he people thought he was charming and funny. Oh, yeah. Like he was charming, he, funny people are sometimes people who do stuff like that because they're charming and funny and it's easy to lure people in. Like, yeah, charisma can be used for evil. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. He was looking to be a new face of the team. Uh, yeah. Rufin said a swear during the interview and it's hysterical because he was so excited. Like people were talking about Jerry and people were talking about Mufin. People are still talking about Jerry, but people have thrown Mufin in the dumpster where he belongs. Yeah, and people aren't talking as much about Jerry either. Um, yeah, hard to be a standout player on a rough team. Yeah, well... And I say that as the stand of the giggery squad, you know? Well, yeah, just to, to... As sort of an explanation of that. One, the two things that made, you know, that made it stand out as one his name is fucking jerry his name his name is jerry Jerry. like when you hear jerry you think of somebody's uncle you think of like a dude in his 40s who probably has a fucking accounting degree and then it's just this unassuming looking dude and his name is jerry and he's on a team right now that is just considered to be dumpster tier and it's just so amusing that on a that in a lineup of all these fucking you know gamer names like fusions and muffin and color hex and halo jerry jerry (laughs) (laughs) and it the, the contrast amused people so much that they just wanted to see him come in and do his thing and then it turned out he popped off and that was one of those things of like, no, it turns out Jerry's got a fucking pair of the size of basketballs down there and he can fucking go. And that's funny as well. But, but the there's is, just something missing in well, the cohesion the is, of this team. That's novelty. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's novelty. And so once the joke kind of wears off and you're used to hearing, up next, Jerry. Like, and having uh, the dude named Jerry actually pop off, it, 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 stops, it stops being remarkable after a while. It's the, it loses its punch. Well, and that's the point of a DPS main, especially a, um... oh God, my brain just said click heads, but that's, Again. thank you. <laughs> my brain's like point and click. And I'm like, yes, click heads is what you do, but there's a term for it. Um, that's the point of a hit scan is to pop off. Mm. So congratulations, you're doing your job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yet so, we don't get tired of say, thank you, Mr. Logics. Well, yeah, because the joke isn't, the joke isn't that he exists. <laughs> this is true. So the, it, yeah, Boston just needs help. Boston also needs a few more players on its roster. And I say that as a Justice fan. Yeah. Well, sort of uh, dovetailing into our next point of um, teams making some pickups. Soul has picked up Slime of Vancouver Titans slash Runaway fame. Good for Um, him. And good for them. Absolutely. Like, I don't think Toby was, like, the problem. But it's hard to not see this as an upgrade for Soul's uh, on-field capability. There are very few teams where picking up a member of the former Titans roster would not be an upgrade. Exactly. Very um, few. Yeah, and apparently other teams are trying to sign other members of Vancouver players. There are rumors. Uh, Gamehouse put out an article about apparently NA teams are trying to sign other Vancouver players, but visa issues are creating a hurdle for them. So, you know... Not surprising. There's the possibility we will see more um, more of them showing up later on. Well, and here's, here's kind of what I'm looking at. It's Thursday night as we record this. The Justice are slated to play the Florida Mayhem on Saturday. 
We have no idea what they're going to do for DPS. I'm opening Reddit right the fuck now. <laughs> Just to see if there's any late breaking news. Um, oh, Fact Fiction is retiring. Yeah, I saw that on Twitter. I'm very sad. He um, just, he, he's a good, he's a good human. I'm getting a reminder right now of the South Korea 2016 World Cup team. And it makes me sad that like none of these people are playing anymore. I think Zunba is the only person who might still be playing professionally. Uh, but yeah, there. Well, well, while we're looking into that and looking at the justice being in the same position, well, a similar position to what Vancouver was in last week, while we wait to see what the fuck they're doing, I want to bring up something today because I can't not bring up Twitter stuff that I thought was hysterical. And I want to talk about it a little bit. The LA Gladiators, who are one of my teams, they're one of my people, They, I had the tweet pulled up and then it went away because the Twitter app likes to refresh itself for no good goddamn reason. They posted a tweet today saying, The May Melee is almost here. This weekend determines our seeding. This is what we need to secure a top four placement and buy round in the tournament bracket. So, these four things need to happen for them to get a top four placement and to get a buy round. One, they need to 3 0 Boston. Yeah, okay, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Odds are good. You can't ever count Boston completely out, but odds are good. <coughs> Two, God bless. Thank you. Two, San Francisco needs to beat Atlanta. Yeah, probably. Like, Atlanta's pretty solid, but San Francisco. So there's always the chance of an upset, but maybe. Mm -hmm. Three, Dallas versus Paris needs to go to a map five. Possibly. Okay, maybe. Possibly. Four, one of these two things needs to happen. Toronto needs to be a Valiant 3-1, to one, or Vancouver needs to 3-0 Philadelphia. That's the point where I started laughing my ass off. That's where you're just like, guess that's not happening. That's where it's just like, good luck with that top four seed. And I just, I, I, like, okay. One of, one of my friends who I can only remember her Twitter name right now, Mm -hmm. One of the lovely Overwatch League fans that we adore mm -hmm. made a comment a while ago about how there are two kinds of LA fans. There are LA fans who have a preference for a team, but will also root for the other LA team because, you know, they like them both. They just like one more than the other. And uh. then there are LA fans who are balls to the wall for their team and completely invested in the rivalry against the opposite LA team. Like, there's no in-between. If you're an L.A. fan, you're either in for both or you're in for this crazy-ass rivalry. Yes. So, I am the first one. I am a Valiant fan first and a Gladiators fan second. I have a preference. The thing is, when it comes to stuff like this, baiting diehard Gladiators fans is like fish in a barrel. It's so much fun. <laughs> and I'm not going to stand here and say I'm a good person because I'm not. I'm really not. But... It's a lot of fun to have stupid, meaningless Twitter throwdowns with the hardcore Gladiators fans who are like, oh, yeah, the Glads are going to lose to Toronto. The Glads, the, the uh, Valiant are going to lose to Toronto. And I'm sitting here going, May is out. Tracer is out. Uh, uh, you sure about that? We're going to have a conversation about that. You sure about that? Also, make sure not to drop any maps against Boston. Like, it, it's just... Yep. I, I find it fun that the Gladiators did this. Like, I like that they did that. Like, here's what needs to happen. And you give the fans something to root for. And you give the fans a reason to watch a, most, a good number of the matches this weekend, even for teams they wouldn't normally watch. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you open yourself up. You just do. For when sure. It's like, one of our win things is either... Atlanta has to 3-1 the Valiant. Or Toronto has to 3-0 the Fusion. <laughs> like, oh my god. This is where they activate their secret weapon. New coach <laughs> Mangachu. <laughs> and I mean, props to Mangachu for going up into coaching. Like, yeah, my dude, yeah. well yeah. done. Apparently, yes. apparently he's been helping other players and just found it really enjoyable and just asked the team, like, hey, can I do this? 
but also there's I, I retweeted it and I put in order one absolutely two yeah probably three maybe four shrieking laughter <laughs> just like if with how specific these are like like Dallas and Paris going to a map five yeah it could happen I don't think it will I but it definitely I could think it, I think it's pretty I think it's fairly likely. It's, it's one of those things where these are so specific yeah. that it could be lost as quickly as dropping a map to Boston, which I find highly unlikely, but... But it's not impossible. But it, it, it's like that picture of the horse where it's segmented into four pieces and the first piece is drawn really well and yeah. the second piece a little less so and the third piece isn't great and the fourth piece is stick figure. That's yeah. what this is to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get you. Um, so I just, I never claim to be a good person, but I also try not to insult people to their faces. I did have it out with a, a Gladiators fan that I rather like, but we, we kind of <laughs> went for it. Yeah, the, some, sometimes you, you just gotta lean into the banter. Oh yeah, well, we, he, he, he insists that a Rhine meta means that Gig is going to lose it for us. And I'm sitting here going, look, as much as I love my boy Agilities, we have no May. And with Tracer being down, that removes a strong hero from both Logics and Sureforce pool. Like, guys, they're good at popping off, but May play is what has been making some of the better maps for them. Mm-hmm. And without that, you have Agilities on Doomfist, Genji, and Sombra? Uh, yes. So, again, I, I don't know what you're going to, like, I love Atlanta, I love my boys, but goddammit, the Valiant better win on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be completely real about this. Yeah, yeah, well, hopefully that will come through for you. Uh, shall we get into the uh, predictions for this coming week so we can uh, lock it in? So, does Reddit have anything to say? Not that I can see. Okay, so we're just going to find out along with everyone else what Justice is planning on doing. And honestly, I you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they managed to pull it out and sign someone from Vancouver. I wouldn't be surprised if they... They, they are a big money. They do have a lot of money. Like, as yeah. a team. I wouldn't be surprised if they pull someone up from... Uh, second tier is not the word. Please help me. Contenders. Tier two. Contenders. Tier two. Thank you. I wouldn't be surprised if they pull a DPS duo up from there, possibly a duo that's had experience working together. Yeah. And sadly, I also wouldn't be surprised if they just take the L for being disqualified for only having one DPS player. I, I love I, Tuba, but you can't win a 5v6 consistently. No, you really, really can't. Meanwhile, lulls a watch. Where the fuck is he? Isn't he having visa issues? Yeah, but Fielder played from fucking Korea. That's that's also kind of what throws me in terms of we can't recruit Titans players because they're in Korea. They're fucking playing from Korea. Like, Fielder's playing from Korea. You just gotta have the balls to do it. And I say this as someone who knows nothing about the inner workings of recruiting people or the business part of the league, so it's entirely possible that they can't for some reason that I don't know. Oh, trust but, me, I'm not, I, I am in no way denying that the, the visa process is complicated and bullshit and full of hurdles, even at the best of times, which now is certainly not. Oh, um, yeah. But you gotta do what you gotta fucking do. And Yeah. And, yeah. So yeah, so we'll see where this goes. It, of course, you know, because we've recorded on Thursday, there will be an announcement on Friday. It always happens. That's it true. never fails. That's just we record and then something goes down. Yeah, I'm going to refresh Reddit. I'm going <laughs> to refresh Reddit like between every, every five minutes. Between like every prediction. <laughs> okay, well, we are starting to hit two hours. So it is prediction o'clock and then we're going to call it a whole hour earlier than we did last week. Yeah. Yeah. So, as a reminder, this week's hero pool, the heroes that are out of rotation, are Tracer, May, Orisa, and Moira. So, having May out of rotation is going to be fun and interesting for our May heavy comps. And I, like I think it. it's only the second time that she's been out of rotation in hero pools. I believe so. The last time, it was Nori, our hero, who took her out. The legend. 
the legend, the hero that we needed, but not what we deserved. <laughs> <laughs> She's beautiful. We don't deserve Nori. And I don't remember if Nori is a she or a he. Beautiful cat. We don't deserve him. Anyway, uh, Soul versus Chengdu. Soul. In this particular meta with these hero pools? Yes. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll come down on that. Just because Chengdu's been ruling a few too many nat ones recently. Yeah, and me. it'll probably swing the other way. But the thing is, I think if it comes down to Soul uh, Chengdu opting into a more meta composition, I think they lose. Yeah, and again, it's also and, a matter of how well can Soul integrate slime and how quickly. Yeah, and leave also um is really really good at tracer i don't think like in a meta where we have like i assume that we're gonna have ryan diva with these bands is uh like ryan and diva is gonna be like fairly prominent you think ryan diva instead of ryan sigma yes explain <laughs> like <laughs> I throw you these because I want to know your reasoning. Because Diva can contest the high ground. The defense matrix is more reliable at mitigating damage than Sigma's shield. Um, the old, um, the mobility is greater, allowing more repositioning and denying damage. Um, I would just like Diva's just a better pick the majority of the time. Like, like. Ryan Diva or Ryan Zarya are the are significantly better than Ryan Sigma. Legit. This this is why I ask you these things. You know so much more about this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so London versus Shanghai. 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 Just Shanghai. Yeah. Uh New York versus Hongshou. I'm going New York. I'm thinking given the track record New York, but I would not be surprised if Hongshou gave them a run for their money. Yes. All right. Now, now here's a fun one. Vancouver versus Houston. Houston. Really? Yes. Even though we're working with a Rhine meta and we know that that is not Muma's strong point. Can you tell me what the Vancouver Titans strong point is? No. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you don't have to twist my arm to get me to go Houston. Yeah. It's... Vancouver is still too much of a question mark to know, but I think it's going to be close either yeah. way. And right now, I, I think even though we only saw Shredlock on the Winston, maybe his Reinhardt is significantly better, he was getting outclassed very badly. KSAA was struggling on the Diva. The support line was hurting. The DPS were not popping off enough. I think just man-to-man the current state of the Vancouver Titans, they are outpowered. I think we'll that the Houston Outlaws have had a lot more time to gel and develop synergy and can deliver better than these players can right now. And that's it being able to work together is important. Yes. Like full stop. It's a team game. You don't win Overwatch without that. Yeah. All right. So For Florida Florida's. versus Washington. Florida. I have to go Florida because, goddammit, Washington doesn't even have a full DPS line right now. Like, if they come out tomorrow and say that they've picked up two of the DPS from uh, the previous Titans lineup, then maybe I'll change my assessment. We've got Stitch and Hoxall. All right, change it. All right. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think for this one, we put an asterisk like, I am switching officially if they pick up two of the DPS from the Titans. <laughs> like, officially. That is my asterisk on this prediction. I'm going justice yeah. if they announce that pickup. Any yeah. other situation, staying with Florida. Yeah, and the thing is, I think Florida, like, right now, like, their front line and back line are performing better than, um, than Washington's. Oh, yeah, Florida is solid. Like, they're not top tier, but they're solid. Yeah, they're, they have advanced to the... They, they are no longer at the kitty table. Yeah. All right, uh, Gladiators versus Boston. Like, gladiators. Next. Gladiator. <laughs> gladiator. The question is, as much as I make fun of, make sure you don't drop a map against Boston. Like, the question is whether or not they break that record. Yes. Honestly. It's not a question of whether they win. 
I feel so bad for Boston. I do too. Oh my god. Uh, shock versus rain. Uh, San Francisco, man. Yeah, San Francisco. San Francisco. Not, not really any doubt of that in my mind. I mean, the last time the rain beat them, it was because the shock C9'd. And we saw Moth's soul exit his body. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Moth. And then they went Super Saiyan. Yeah, pretty much. They they C9 and then they were like, oh, okay. And then they ran train through the loser's bracket. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so there's, so there's, and maybe if they'd won, we would have had a different story. Well, we would have had a different story because they would have met Vancouver far earlier. But you know, mm-hmm. here we are. Still going with San Francisco. Yes. All right. Guangzhou versus Chengdu. Guangzhou. Guangzhou. Just Guangzhou is shaping them up to shaping themselves up to be a new New York. Like you can't not. Yeah. Uh, Hongshou versus London. Hongshou. Yeah, we still haven't seen enough out of London to really know, and consistently inconsistent is kind of how they roll. Yeah. Dallas versus Paris. Dallas. Paris. All right. I'm throwing down for Paris, despite the fact that we have Fielder on 200 ping, because we saw what Fielder can do on 200 ping. And again, Dallas holding the line with Philly, Paris holding the line with Philly, and almost consistently going to map fives with them. Like, I think we have a match here, but I'm going Paris. The reason I'm going Dallas is one, I think Gansu is a better main tank than Nosemite. Two, you have the picks that the Paris DPS have shown the most promise on uh, lately. Well, because we know how good soon's tracer is it's literally what got him signed to the overwatch league yes um and nico had looked very very good on the may those had been kind of the heroes they looked best on um over the sort of start over the, you know the season to date so that's out of there and i think decay and doha are frankly better at those heroes to begin to anyway um so really the only place where I would give Paris an edge is if we are going to see Ana. I think Fielder might have an edge over Crimzo, but we haven't really seen Crimzo get to do his Ana uh, since he's really gotten the opportunity to fully integrate into the Dallas Fuel. So we don't necessarily know how that is going to look, but I think Dallas has an edge in a lot of areas uh, over the Paris turn. I also think you're picking Dallas because you're you. It's much the same reason I tend to pick the Valiant. <laughs> well, yeah, but here, and, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not trying to invalidate your bias. I'm making a funny. This is why I'm on the podcast. Stupid <laughs> jokes. I know my role. Uh, yeah, <laughs> main support in bronze. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just explaining my reasoning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and I'm. I'm still going with Paris. I think this is like going to be the one where we differ. Blue versus blue. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Philly versus Vancouver. Now, as a Gladiators fan, I think Vancouver is going to 3-0 Philly. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Just, I can't. can't you can't get it out. I tried. <laughs> um, no, yeah. it's Philly. It's Philly. Philly. And then lastly... Toronto versus the Valiant. I'm going back. I'm going to say it again. The Valiant better damn well win on my birthday. <laughs> yeah, I'm going Valiant. I'm ordering in Guildhall. My roommate has agreed. She's Usually I put on Overwatch League and she leaves the room because there's really nothing in it for her. But mm-hmm. it's like, we're watching this, goddammit. And she's agreed to put up with that. So, <laughs> it better win. And again, going back to it, we have, with the hero pool that we have, with Tracer and May out, I think that puts Toronto at a disadvantage in terms of their DPS line. To a certain extent. Yeah, like, I don't think it's, oh no, they're completely boomed because of it, but I think KSF, KSP, and Shax are strong enough on other heroes that it won't affect them as badly. Pretty much. Whereas, again, I love Agilities, but you've said it, he's Feast or Famine, and he's had some very strong May play as of late, and with May out of the lineup, what do? He has been going hungry more often than not. 
And the flip side of it is, it is a Rhine meta, and I love Gig, but Gig's Rhine I don't think is his strong suit. Bless him. It's his only suit. What else have we seen him play? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and yet... <laughs> anyway. Also, you're assuming that... You're assuming... So a hyper aggro Ryan has its uses, and I think against a team like Toronto, it can be something you can deploy as an amazing stress test to see just how well integrated Cruz is. This is true. And also, we've got McGravy, and McGravy has been solid. McGravy yeah. has been solid. Absolutely, he has. We have the power of anime and Halsey on our side. We're going to do fine. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is where we are. We pretty much agreeing on everything except for blue versus blue. Yep. I, I, I'm excited for this weekend. I can't wait to see how all of this madness shakes out. Yeah, I'm very interested in seeing how all these games go. They're going to be good ones. Yeah, and I mean, I feel bad for Vancouver for being immediately thrown into the meat grinder, but I will still be interested in seeing how they do. And it will be a thing for them if they are able to pull out a win against the Outlaws. I'm still pulling for the Outlaws, but it'll say something about Vancouver if they are able to take that W. Yes, I don't think that they will, but... Yeah. That's why we're both going for the green team, as opposed to the green team. So, has Reddit said anything interesting in the past, oh, five minutes? I would be very surprised if that were the case. Let's be completely honest. Okay. That was quite a lead up for a single no. I... <laughs> it's a RoboCop reference. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so there we are. We, um, we'll, we'll, those are our predictions with one asterisk on my part. We'll see what happens. Do you want to partake in the asterisk prediction as well, or are you sticking with Florida regardless? I think I'm just sticking with Florida. Like, I think even with the new DPS line, the performance of the rest of the Washington Justice has been so fucking spotty that I don't think they would necessarily be able to like lift them through it. Legit. I'm I'm sticking with my asterisk, partially because it's a novelty. We haven't done that before. Because things have not been this insane before. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh... <laughs> we haven't needed a team to replace a third of their fucking capacity uh, ahead of a match before. Or all of their capacity, like we had last week. Yes. I was legitimately wondering if, Tor if Toronto, if Vancouver was just going to take the L on both days and not have anyone. Like, I was curious. So, yeah. So, this is going to be fun and interesting. Mm -hmm. In the meantime... I'm Katie. You can follow me all over the social medias, as well as on YouTube and Twitch at Kiaget, that is K-I-A-X-E-T. I'm CJ. You can find me on Twitter at the uh, rage underscore, the underscore rage underscore nerd. Um, I don't go on there all that much. Like, this is probably where you're going to find me the most. Uh, but, yeah, I'm just here doing my thing. You show up on Twitter when I ping you and say dumb shit. Yeah, I, ch I check it like once a day. <laughs> yep. You can follow the podcast Twitter, which I keep saying I'm going to do more with and then I keep failing to do because I get distracted because that is life in the time of COVID. Yep. Um, at On The Point Pod. You can follow us on all of your different various podcast services, which we do through Anchor. So I believe it should be anchor slash on the point or anchor slash on the point pod. Check that out. Thank you guys for listening. Are we good? Yeah. All right. Let's see nine. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> <laughs> no shame. No regrets. We have fun. Yeah.